All right, here we go. All right, good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Thursday, April 20th, 2023 Planning Board meeting. If we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Introduction to board members. Starting from the far left, we have Paul Amatucci. We have Jerry Graybill. We have Don Ganarelli. Myself, Michael LaRue. We have Phil Roy, Matt Henry, and Cameron Hladic. We also have Irish Griffith, the code enforcement officer. And we have Hannah Bonine from SMPDC. All right, now the next thing is we have a guest presentation, um, Thatcher Carter from Maine Farmland Trust. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think I'm going to have some slides come up on the screen shortly. Great. So yeah, my, my name is Thatcher Carter. Um, I'm the Municipal Policy Associate with Maine Farmland Trust. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, and I'm really excited to talk tonight about some farm-friendly strategies that Maine municipalities can pursue. Um, I'll head to the next slide. So just to begin, I wanted to give a bit of background about my position and the work that I've been doing. Um, I began with Maine Farmland Trust in July of 2022, and since then I've been working um, to update the municipal policy and planning guide that we put out called Cultivating Maine's Agricultural Future. Um, it was originally published in 2011 in partnership with American Farmland Trust uh, and the Maine Watch Institute. And while it's still a useful resource for towns, we are now in the process um, of updating it to feature new trends as well as examples of Maine municipalities actively using many of the strategies that I'm going to discuss tonight. Uh, so this updated version is coming soon and it's being completed in collaboration with the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Um, and in addition to working on this guide, I'm also now beginning to transition into a more direct technical assistance role. Um, and through that, I'm going to be looking to support municipalities in adopting, uh, again, some of these farm-friendly strategies that I'm going to go over tonight. Next slide, please. So a quick overview of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to just explain what Maine Farmland Trust is and then look to answer two key questions. Uh, why should municipalities support agriculture and how can municipalities support agriculture? And under that second question, I'm going to look at inventories and information gathering, uh, different municipal planning and land use strategies, two non-regulatory land protection approaches, um, as well as a municipal, municipal tax program that can be adopted um, in Maine by ordinance. And then I'll close off with some questions and comments. Next slide, please. So Maine Farmland Trust is a member-powered statewide organization with a mission to protect farmland, support farmers, and advance the future of farming. Uh, we were fo founded in 1999 by a group of farmers and farm advocates, and our programs and focus areas include farmland protection and access, where we've worked to help permanently protect more than 330 farms and keep nearly 60,000 acres of farmland in farming, um, and our farm network, which includes farm business planning and our soil health network. Um, we have an engagement team as well as a policy and research team, which includes me at the municipal level, as well as people working at the state and federal level as well. Next slide, please. So why should municipalities support agriculture? Uh, in order to know why, it's essential to understand what challenges are facing Maine farmland. Uh, according to the USDA Census of Agriculture, between 2012 and 2017, Maine lost more than 570 farms uh, and roughly 10% of its farmland at about 146,000 acres. Uh, so Maine farmland is facing development pressure and it's coming from multiple different competing land uses. So then why? Well, Farms provide environmental and climate resilience benefits. Uh, farming is, of course, a natural resource-based industry, and farmers are stewards of the land. Uh, ensuring that farmland remains in farming is also a key natural climate solution. Uh, undeveloped agricultural land and farmers using healthy soil practices mitigate the impacts of climate change by sequestering carbon uh, and limiting greenhouse gas emissions. They also provide a slew of local benefits. Uh, farmland Farmland provides a certain quality of life uh, from the rural character that's created by natural and working lands. And a robust local food and farming system is also critical for ensuring food security for our state and region in the face of global supply chain disruptions, such as those caused by COVID-19, 
um, and which are anticipated to continue in the future as a result of climate change. Uh, local benefits can also include recreational access, educational programming, as well as certain cultural and historical aspects as well. Uh, and finally, there are fiscal and economic benefits. Uh, Maine agriculture contributes over $3.6 billion in economic impact and supports over 27,000 jobs statewide. That's according to a 2020 report by the Farm Credit East Northeast Economic Engine. Agritourism is also on the rise in Maine, bringing new people into the community to enjoy the farm as well as other parts of town, such as local businesses and shops. Um, and uh, if I could go to the next slide, please. Uh, through cost of community service studies, it's apparent that farms also provide a fiscal benefit to towns. Um, local officials and residents sometimes believe that residential development will lower the property tax will lower property taxes by growing the municipal tax base. But cost of community service studies generally disprove this. Uh, while farms may generate less tax revenue than residential properties, they require even less in the way of public infrastructure and services. So more than 30 years of studies show that farms require a median cost of 37 cents in services for every dollar of tax revenue collected, whereas residential properties require a median cost of $1.16 in services. Again, that's for every dollar of tax revenue collected. So this uh, type of study and this perspective can be valuable when considering the benefits of pursuing municipal farmland protection strategies. Uh, next slide, please. So now transitioning into how can a municipality support agriculture. Um, now that we've established some reasons for why, I want to give some tools for how. Um, it's important to note that uh, maybe one or a combination of these tools could work best, and there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, each municipality has unique needs and circumstances. Uh, and another thing I wanted to note is that if you hear or see something that you want more information on, um, such as examples of other main towns uh, where you might be able to see their ordinance language, just let me know, and I'll be sure to follow up with you um, after the fact. Next slide, please. So the first step um, is often gathering information. Gathering information directly from farmers as well as collecting an inventory of known farms and farmland <laughs> is a great first step in developing effective policies that will have direct impacts on local farming residents. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so farmer sur surveys are a great tool for gathering direct input from farmers and farmland owners. Um, you can get both quantitative as well as qualitative data for, from them. So, for example, you can directly ask what ordinance changes could help support farmers um, or what other ways could the town additionally support your farm operation and ask sort of those open-ended, broad questions to receive feedback in that way. And on the other hand, you can also ask questions like, uh, how much acreage are you currently cultivating? How much acreage do you own that you aren't cultivating but you could be cultivating? What types of crops do you grow? How much? And you can derive more number-based answers from that. Uh, and this information can help support municipal planning efforts such as a comprehensive plan or another independent effort. Uh, farms and farmland inventories are another great tool for information gathering. Um, inventories can be basic or complex, but the goal should be to establish an understanding and a record of local farms and important agricultural soils. Prime farmland and soils of statewide significance are mapped by the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and locally significant so soils are typically identified through the local soil and water conservation district. Um, inventories can take on a simple list or a map format, um, and farms can be identified through tax maps and property records, uh, talking with local farmers, local networking, and simply um, also by just driving around the, the town. Um, and an inventory can also be used to develop local farmland protection goals, um, and it can be a great starting point for understanding how much agriculture is actually going on in your town. Um, and both surveys and inventories can also be great tools for facilitating farmland access. So you can ask farmers if they're looking for more farmland, um, or you can ask if they're interested in leasing their land, and you can try and make some of those farm seeker, farm owner connections. Um, and finally, um, with information and inventorying, I also wanted to mention agricultural commissions. Um, those are another great tool for ensuring that farmers' voices and concerns are heard in municipal policy, though through a much more formal process. Um, but a municipal committee like that can help to ensure that farmers' voices are heard and integrated into policy. Next slide, please. Great. So surveys and inventories can all help get a town to a point where it's able to create really effective farm-friendly policies. And now this part of the presentation, I'm transitioning into more regulatory municipal planning and land use. Um, that is policy and planning strategies that a town can adopt to better support farm viability um, and farmers' ability to farm. Um, and of course, we always strongly encourage consulting with a legal expert or town planner when coming up with ordinances. All of this is for informational purposes, um, but I'm, again, always happy to discuss more after the fact. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, so uh, comprehensive plans are the legal underpinning for town ordinances, um, and they also describe a vision for the future. I know you, yes? Could you talk a little slower? You know what you're talking about, yes. but we don't. So sorry, so sorry. So <laughs> comprehensive plans, um, as you know, you're underway right now, are the legal underpinning for town ordinances, and they also describe a vision for the future. Um, so therefore, to incorporate farming and agriculture effectively into a comprehensive plan, it's important to seek out input directly from farmers, perhaps using one of the tools that I just mentioned. So some general guidelines for towns creating agricultural-friendly comprehensive plans include establishing the issues and needs relevant to your local area. So not just statewide policies and goals, but finding what is specific in Berwick that you need to identify. Um, and also including strong and supportive statements about farm and farming. Um, this means capturing the full range of benefits that farms offer not just contributions to rural character and scenery, but also viewing them as an economic engine as well. Um, also look to integrate agriculture throughout the plan where appropriate. So perhaps it would make sense to include goals and strategies related to agriculture not only in the agricultural and forestry section, but also in the local economy chapter, the climate change chapter, as well as the transportation chapter. Um, look to include policies and implementation strategies that address the full range of farm businesses and land use needs. Um, and avoid, avoid important agricultural soils when defining a growth area. So prime agricultural soils and soils of statewide importance are the most conducive to productive farming, um, and only 14% of the soils in Maine are classified in these categories. That's according to the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, finally, make sure to delegate implementation to appropriate officials and have a strong implementation plan uh, and a timeline to ensure that some of these strategies are actually enacted. So for example, um, some strategies you could include might be tasking the planning board with evaluating the town's existing land use ordinances and recommending changes that will help support farm operations. Uh, you could recommend that farming be integrated into a town's economic development strategy or recommend ways that the town might assist farmers with marketing, just as one example. Um, you could also promote the use of programs that lower farmers' tax burden, such as the current use programs through the state or the Voluntary Municipal Farm Support Program which I'll talk about more in a little bit. Next slide, please. Great, so some general guidance for farm-friendly land use ordinances. Um, we generally really recommend looking for flexibility and good definitions. So a land use ordinance should be sufficiently flexible to allow farmers to grow and diversify their businesses, and there's a lot to consider here. Uh, some farms generate additional income through on-farm activities, for example, maybe operating a machine repair shop. Um, this income diversification supplements the farming income and helps the farm farming operation survive temporary economic downturns, so it's important that activities like this be accommodated in the ordinance. Um, ideally, a land use ordinance will also allow appropriate agricultural activities anywhere in a municipality, maybe with the possible exception of a downtown or a small village district where urban agriculture could also still be uh, defined and allowed. Um, an, ordin an ordinance's definition of farm or agriculture should include a wide array of buildings, including barns, sheds, greenhouses, hoop houses, processing facilities, as well as retail facilities. Um, and definitions should also recognize that not all farmers share the same needs. So it's important for towns to understand the diversity of farming operations um, and individuals who are engaging in agriculture in their community and ensure that the definition of farming is culturally relevant to the diverse needs of local farmers. Um, allowable farm activities in an ordinance could include raising, handling, packing, processing, storing, and direct selling of farm products, uh, maintaining farm equipment and buildings, on-farm renewable energy production that supports the electricity needs of the farm operation, uh, as well as non-agricultural business activities, excuse me, so long as they are compatible with farming. Um, land use ordinances should also recognize that farm stands and pick-your-own operations are similar in some respects to other retail establishments, but they also differ in important ways. Uh, they are seasonal and limited in scale, um, and some operations might generate significant customer volume for a short period of time, whereas other operations may offer a wider variety of products over a longer season. Uh, some farms are also incorporating agritourism ventures now, and that can include tours, rides, restaurants, catering, and special events, so it's important to have those integrated into land use ordinance as well. So again, just some sort of general provisions, um, ordinance provisions that can really make an impact. Those include promoting uh, new development in the growth area. That could be through smaller lot sizes, uh, density bonuses, or other strategies. Um, you could require that most or all new commercial activity that isn't farm-related 
is located in the growth area. Um, you can avoid minimum lot sizes and road frontage requirements that would result in the splitting or fragmentation of farmland. Uh, require that new development located next to farms be set back adequately from property lines. Uh, and also look to reduce setback requirements for certain farm structures from the roads. And this is because farm stands may need easy access and visibility to be successful and requiring a large setback from the road can require a farmer to place a structure in the middle of their best farm soils back on the property where it may not be visible. Um, and one tool that can be really effective in sort of wrapping together a lot of these strategies is an agricultural overlay district. Um, a town may want to consider establishing an agricultural overlay district and then applying different ordinance standards within that zone. So agricultural overlay districts may help mitigate problems between farms and non-farming neighbors, and they can also reduce the footprint or impact of new development on farmland. Um, overlay zones can be identified and delineated on the basis of productive agricultural soils, which are mapped by the NRCS, um, or contiguous areas of active farms. And typically, the underlying district requirements remain in effect, as with most overlay zones, um, excess, except as modified by the agricultural standards. Um, so agricultural, district, uh, agricultural overlay districts are another way towns can um, allow additional agricultural-related uses by right, such as agritourism or compatible non-agricultural businesses. Um, and towns may limit the expansion of infrastructure, such as roads and sewers, into the zone uh, to reduce the potential for future development. <coughs> Next slide, please. Another type of ordinance that can either be wrapped up into a agricultural overlay district or stand on its own is a right to farm ordinance. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, at times, farming as well as odors, slow traffic, and noise, uh, they can all go hand in hand. So a local right to farm ordinance affirms a commitment to agriculture and identifies farming as an accepted and valued activity. Um, so such an ordinance could be modeled after Maine's Agricultural Protection Act, which is also known as the right to farm law. Um, and you can recognize and cite the definitions that are used in that law. Uh, you can describe what may be perceived as a nuisance and then clearly state that these are protected activities, provided that best management practices are followed. Uh, it can include setback requirements that put the onus on the developer um, to make sure that a new residential or commercial property is set back from an active farm. Um, you can also require a landowner that's selling property next to an active farm to provide the buyer with a notice that discloses the town's support for agriculture and the types of activities that may be associated with living directly next to an active agricultural operation. Next slide, please. Great, so I'm actually just going to hand these out to you all real quick. Um, and what I've just passed out is something that Maine Farmland Trust has been working on a lot recently. Uh, it's our guide that looks at balancing solar development and farmland protection. Um, so state policy changes in 2019 led to a large increase in solar development across the state. Um, in one study, 90% of 185 proposals approved by the Maine DEP as of June 2021 intersected <coughs> with prime and statewide farm soils in some way. That was a study by Maine Audubon. Um, thank you. And in this study, only 34% of the acreage proposed for development actually covered the soils, um, but the analysis, analysis does help to illustrate the extent to which solar development is being approved on farmland in Maine. So Maine Farmland Trust believes that with balanced siting, solar energy generation and agriculture can coexist in Maine in a mutually beneficial manner. Uh, and our solar siting guide compiles general guidance, municipal policy tools and planning strategies that are all um, designed to help support this idea of balanced solar siting. Uh, in the guide, there's three case studies featuring the city of Auburn, the town of Topsom, as well as the town of Reedfield. So I really recommend that you take a look at that. Next slide, please. And these are our general agricultural solar siting guidelines that's included in that guide on page five. I'm not going to go through them all right now, but again, on page five, you can look through those. Next uh, slide, please. Great. Um, and another tool that is established by ordinance that I wanted to talk about tonight are special development fees. Um, and development fees can be used to help farmland protection, uh, help fund farmland protection projects. So while fees generated from a single development are highly unlikely to generate sufficient funding, uh, fees can be collected over time and coupled with other funds to achieve this purpose. Um, impact fees are established through an ordinance and they require developers to pay a fee to offset their development's impact on a town. Um, in creating an ordinance like this, you would want to establish clear goals and connections um, to protecting farmland and explicitly state that. 
Um, and these fees are generally based on dwelling units or square feet proposed. So the bigger the development, the larger, in theory, generally, the, theory would, the fee would be. Um, development transfer fee programs are another tool under this sort of header of special development fees. Um, they are established through an ordinance that defines fees, credits, transfer districts, density standards, and administrative rules. And in this instance, uh, developers pay a transfer fee, allowing them to build more units in the growth area than would um, what otherwise be allowed under the existing ordinance. Um, so towns should specify that protecting farmland is a town priority, and then the payments that are made for those density bonuses can be used to protect farmland in the designated rural area. Next slide, please. <laughs> Great. Um, and just two non-regulatory land protection approaches that I wanted to talk about tonight that can sort of wrap into ordinances sometimes and I think also are just good to be aware of are agricultural conservation easements as well as leasing land to farmers. So I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but an agricultural conservation easement is a voluntary, permanent, enforceable restriction that landowners place on their property. Um, and such easements prevent subdivision as well as non-agricultural development. Um, the property remains in private ownership, however, the easement does run with the land, uh, and the entity that holds the easement is responsible for enforcing its terms. So that's typically a land trust, but towns are also able to hold easements as well. Um, and towns can use permanent agricultural conservation easements by encouraging landowners to grant them by providing funding to help pay for them. This could be through a development fee, like I mentioned earlier, um, another municipal funding source if it's available. It could be through a state or a federal grant program um, or in a partnership with a land trust. Um, and then secondly, leasing land to farmers is another non-regulatory approach. Um, and municipalities may also want to see how they can promote farmland leasing opportunities in town um, or facilitate the leasing of town-owned land if that's applicable. Um, so land availability and land affordability can be huge obstacles for new farmers that are looking to establish themselves, uh, as well as existing farmers that are looking to expand their operations. Uh, if, a if a municipality happens to own land that could be used for farming, the town could explore options to lease it out uh, to a new or beginning farmer. Um, and while there are many steps to this, if it's an approach that you all are interested, I'm happy to talk about it more at a later time. Um, and finally, towns can also promote farmland leasing opportunities. So, for example, a town could help uh, increase awareness for land that's being made available by a land trust or another private landowner. Um, and they could also do that through an inventory, like I mentioned earlier, trying to identify uh, farm seekers as well as farm owners in the community and try and make that connection. Next slide, please. Great. And finally, um, I wanted to talk about a program in Maine called the Voluntary Municipal Farm Support Program. Uh, this program is outlined in state statutes, um, and a town can adopt this local program to lower property taxes on participating farms. So this is established through an ordinance, um, and through the program, farmers can receive property tax reductions in exchange for 20-year agricultural conservation easements on their land. And in this instance, the town does hold and monitor the easements. Um, and this program can also apply to property taxes on eligible farm buildings as well as land. So it can really help support the viability of farms and protect local farmland in that way because while the current use programs apply directly to the land, this can also apply to buildings as well. Um, and it's great because if a municipality chooses this route, um, they don't need to budget for reimbursing. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, if, if a municipality chooses this route, uh, instead of acquiring funds to purchase agricultural easements, they can instead just reimburse and budget for whatever amount that they would be giving um, otherwise. So we'll have a great case study um, of Winslow's Voluntary Municipal Farm Support Program coming up in our municipal guide, um, and I will be sure to share that with you all when um, it is released. So thank you so much. Um, I can go to the next slide, and if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. I know that was a lot. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of questions. Thank you for your time this evening, and thank you, Jeremy, for, for being the catalyst to, to get this before us. I, I think it's important, and in our joint session, we talked about the importance of preserving you know, our farmland and our, and our small town feel. I think the biggest hurdle for us is if when you're competing for getting people to put land in a trust and the grant dollars that are available and the incentives for farming, a lot of our community, our older farmers in this community, are retiring and the family
tradition and the family uh, are, are not taking over as farmers. And, and that's the biggest struggle. Yeah. Um, one of the things, if we, if we go down this route, and I think Washington County, Maine has, has learned some very hard lessons with when it, as it comes to leasing land for farming. Um, when your hands are tied and you get federally subsidized programs that come in and they're like, hey, this is a great idea. Let's use this byproduct to fertilize the land. And now they're dealing with PFAS issues. Mm -hmm. So are there issues, are there checks and balances in place now, hopefully, because what's going on in Washington County where you can't even harvest a deer and eat it and you can't grow crops because we've, we've destroyed the farmland up there. Are there checks and balances in place if we elect to go down this road and, and make it farm friendly that we still maintain control that big industry isn't going to come in here and force our hand to use something because it's subsidized and we think it's a good idea? Um. I'll be honest, I don't have a, a great answer to that question. I know with the PFAS issue specifically, um, it's now no longer happening in the state. So with that specific issue, um, I think I just that, worry, yeah. my, my big concern is, you know, roughly, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was seven or eight years ago, industry decided, hey, this is a great way to utilize a byproduct of the paper industry to fertilize and, and grow crops, which it grows crops that are great. You just can't eat them. <laughs> and I, and, and we've destroyed that area of our state. So I, I just don't want our municipalities hands to be tied because we buy into a federal program mm -hmm. and, and they tell us how our farmers or the people who are farming that land, what they have to use. And, and we end up owning that long term. That that's my, would be my biggest concern. Yeah, and I, I think it's a valid concern. I think a lot of the programs and strategies I talked about um, that might be great starting points would be done purely at the municipal level. So you wouldn't have to worry about that. So, so for example, looking through and revising your ordinances um, or establishing something like a voluntary municipal farm support program, uh, that would be under your jurisdiction and uh, you wouldn't have to worry about that. In terms of that bigger picture that you're talking about, I don't have a great answer and I I, it might be case by case, um, but I, I think it's a, a valid thing to bring up. I, uh, I, I hail from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. It's probably the most richest farm country in the world. And the county, the county itself is self-supportive because of the farms. And they do have ordinances and things. And, you know, maybe we need to, uh, instead of reinvent the wheel, like branch out and find out what they're doing because it, it's been successful down there for as long as I was growing up down there and it's still successful. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in some instances, there's very different types of farming. So that first couple slides I went through about right. farm surveys and farm inventories, um, you know, all of the examples that I gave of what you could do are great, but really the most effective ones are going to be um, you know, effective policies are going to be derived from what the local farmers are saying. So it could end up like something like they do in Lancaster or, but, or if you hear otherwise from local farmers, it could be something completely different. Right. Um, so yeah, that's why I like started with that present, that right. portion of the presentation is I really think that's the foundation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you both all so much. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. I don't think so. Okay. All right, moving right along, we have public hearing, preliminary plan, major subdivision, Woodland Pond, Alley Pond, R7, Lot 2, and Johnny Lane, R8, 6-6, Altus Engineering. <coughs> For the record, I'm Eric Sowery from Alts Engineering. Um, I don't see any butters here, which is interesting. Um, do you want me to go through what's changed? 
Yes, if you could, please. Okay. Well, we've received uh, review comments from the town engineer, um, and we have believe we've addressed them all. It should be a copy of the return letter in your packet. Um, not a lot of substantive change in terms of the layout. Uh, the road hasn't moved, none of the lots have moved. Uh, it's a lot of little nitpicky items that were little things, label this, do that, and so all those things have been addressed. Um, we did have a conversation with IFNW. Finally, we tracked them down. Isaiah and I had a Zoom meeting with um, John Perry and uh, Derek York, the turtle guy. And he had a couple of comments. They had a couple of comments. There's a copy of the correspondence uh, with them uh, in the packet. Uh, basically, they don't have a lot of jurisdiction here, but they did make some suggestions that we could make the project a little bit better and more palatable for uh, the black racer snakes and as well as the turtles in the neighborhood. Um, the biggest one is this section of lot four here. Uh, they wanted a no-cut restriction on the back of it, which we've done. You can see that on the plan. So this about half the lot is now not going to be cut. It's going to stay as is. Um, they wanted us to reach out to um, Great Works Land Trust about perhaps taking an easement over the open space. Um, we did reach out to them. We had a little conversation, and they kind of want something weird. I've never run into it. Um, they want a separate lot between the house lots and their conservation easement so that they're abutting one owner, in this case the HOA, versus 11 homeowners, which doesn't – it's not really workable, uh, unfortunately. I mean – I try to do a layout, it just doesn't fit. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen, um, unfortunately. Uh, we did add some turtle crossing signs, uh, per Derek's suggestion, at three locations throughout it. Um, he mentioned they could be seasonal, where if you've got turtle breeding season where they're moving around, they could be covered up. He was going to get me a detail on that, but he hasn't. But there is a turtle sign in the packet that you guys have seen. Um, let's see, what else? That was pretty much it. He did say logging could continue in the open space. He said that's actually good for the black racer snake, which I was really surprised to hear. Um, we have no intention of doing that, but the HOA could do so if they wanted to in the future for whatever reason. Um, it's not restricted right now in the HOA documents. Um, I don't know if you guys have a preference on that or not. Uh, we can restrict it or allow it. It's, I don't see an HOA doing it, to be honest with you. Um, he did say paving the road is actually a good thing because turtles don't want to uh, crawl across a road, and they certainly don't want to uh, nest there, which is what we had in this instance when the roads were gravel. Um, the only other change is I've added the turnaround, which I talked about before, as well as an apron uh, at the dry hydrant, where you, the fire truck could pull off, hook it on the dry hydrant, uh, which we're going to replace in its entirety, and have a little way, place to back up. This little backup area was actually supposed to be built back in 2006, I think. Um, it never got constructed, so this is sort of, you know, rehatching that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that. That way a fire truck's not going down there to a dead end, uh, which this is because we do have a gate right here now. Um, that's going to be a double leaf gate. The fire department will have access to it. We'll have a Knox, Knox box there that they can open the gate if they need to get through. Um, what else? Oh, the replacement of the dry hydrant itself. I did file a PBR with uh, DEP for that. Uh, we do have a little bit of wetland impact right in through here. It's temporary. Obviously, we're just going to find the old pipe, dig it up, and replace it with a new one. That also went to the Army Corps. Um, in that same correspondence to the Army Corps, I asked about the two culvert crossings that were done uh, that need to be replaced and haven't heard back yet. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I think the packet and the application are complete. Uh, there's one waiver ahead of you guys right now. It's for the road intersection. Uh, the rules uh, stipulate that you can't have three percent uh, a road exceeding 3% in either direction for 75 feet from the intersection. In this case, I've got about three going this way and about four and a half to five coming down in here. I've got a great shot, a picture of it that I can show you guys from shot from here. The reason they, they want that is for sight distance. And the picture shows that there's more than adequate sight distance. Plus, this road's coming from nowhere. Where if you, you're not going to come through the gate, crash through it, and go out the intersection. You just can't. The only, only uh, vehicle that would be coming out that way would be a fire truck, and everybody is going to get out of the way anyway. Uh, so I really don't see that from an engineering perspective to be an issue um, at all. I mean, I can send that photograph around if you guys want to take a look. Uh, but it's, it's in this particular case, it's nonsensical. So that is a shot from approximately the dry hydrant area uh, looking up towards the intersection. So you can see there's no sight distance issue at all.
Irish, I could send that to you for the file. Okay, thanks, please. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. All right, well, it's the board's pleasure. Well, now we'll just see if anyone has any uh, comments to make, and then we'll close it. Do you want your picture? Do you want it? Put it on the fridge? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Give me such pretty pictures. It's, I mean, look, it's a lovely dirt road. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's lovely. Uh, that, that, was, that was last fall. The grass was just popping, so it's bright green. Yeah. I got the bright green, the uh -huh. browns, yeah. the real earth tones oh, yeah. going. It's good she couldn't make I like it. it. Yeah, she told me last week that she couldn't make it. Um, okay, well, then we'll close the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, moving along, we're going to open up the first public comment for non-agenda items. If you, if you want to come up, just state your name and your address. No? Okay. We'll close that. And moving along, um, we're going to do the approval of minutes. Um, we have two, one that we didn't approve last meeting because we didn't have a quorum for it. Um, I was... Um, out that on that meeting so March 2nd 2023 um, I'll make a motion uh, we I had previously reviewed them we did not have a quorum last time but uh, I see no reason we should not approve the minutes as drafted I'll second that okay they and were amended though right as far as I know there was one there was thing. a question on there about being amended I think so I'll Double check that. So just put it as with amendments. As amended. As amended. As amended. Uh, okay. Um, for the discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And all of you guys were here? No, Matt, you weren't here, so you're abstaining. <laughs> okay. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. Next is the March sixteenth, twenty twenty three uh, minutes. Uh, we had them via email. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was your 11th hour minutes that got emailed out. Okay. 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 Make a motion that we approve them as written. Okay. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? All right. All right. And then we have three abstaining. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, next, moving along, in old business, preliminary plan, major subdivision, Woodland Pond, Alley Pond, R7, Lot 2, and Johnny Lane, R86-6, Altus Engineering. Um, thank you. Well, well, <laughs> you got more pictures for me? I don't have any more pictures. <laughs> I can see you are. I've got tons of them. We've got the whole site. Um, well, I just made my presentation. So yeah, I guess no, I, it seems any, like you've yeah, covered everything that I, was of concern. Yeah, um, any questions? Uh, I, the one thing that I don't have, and usually we'll get um, a summary from like Hannah or Lee J, is for the waiver and stuff. So I just don't know. Yeah, I didn't write much about it. Um, okay. I I recommended that it, it be approved, especially based on that picture. The only question I have about that is, you're saying this is a dirt road that leads to nowhere. Is that always going to lead to nowhere? Do who, we not know that? Who, who is knows? That um, I, I have no idea um, what could happen with, with this in the future. I know it does get pretty wet once you get past it. Um, if it were to, let's say, be developed at some point in the future, I would recommend that you make this a three-way stop, and that way it eliminates the, the site distance issue altogether. But right now, it's this is a throughway, but you're going through to nowhere. Right. Um, and you have a stop sign going this way. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it, it's not a big grade difference from no, from the thing, no, but. Since part of it is, it's going to nowhere if we just want to. Okay. Make sure. Other than that. All know. right. If I may. Yeah, sure. Uh, in on sheet C3, C3, your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, your eighth bullet point, uh, we disagree with the reviewer and have not added proposed contours. Um, there's a lot of legal jargon in there. Can you, can you break it down <laughs> for simple people like let myself? Me, let me pull that up. Sheet C3. Okay, this is talking about 
the profile. Um, a lot of engineers will put existing proposed contours on their road profiles. I tend to think it's clutter because I, I use the profile to be a layout plan. Here's where your curves are and what the curve length is and what the radius is, things of that nature, where your stop signs are and your paint. If you add all this other, I don't want to call it junk, but stuff on top of that, the plan becomes really difficult to read. In this case, I added a separate grading and drainage plan. So those contours are in the plan set. They're just on a separate sheet. Okay. So it sort of, sort of separates those two things. It makes, makes an extra page, but I think it makes the plan easier to follow. And okay. that, that's just a personal choice. That makes sense. Thank you. It was, it was difficult to pick that out in the verbiage. <laughs> so. Sorry about that. Nope, no worries. Okay. So, Hannah, would the first um, action be to grant that we go for that motion for the waiver and then the um, approval for the preliminary application? Have we, are you uh, voted on completeness yet? Yes, and we've scheduled the site walk and the public okay. hearing, so we then just yes. didn't know about the waiver until now. Yes. Okay, all right, yeah. so we'll do that. Um, I just don't have the information in front of me for what the waiver. Mm -hmm. It is a waiver of Article 12, Section 2, Table 12.2-3 of the minimum grade within 75 feet of an intersection, <laughs> which is wordy. So I okay. don't know how you want to present it, but I can you want me to run that up too? So you yeah, can, yeah, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if the, if the memos just didn't get included in your package. Yeah, yeah. Like I think it came with the email. I just okay. It's just not here right now. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. So... I'll make a motion that we approve the waiver of Article 12, Section 2, Table 2-2.2-3, two maximum grade within 75 feet of intersection. Mr. Chairman, I think it was 12.2-3. Yeah, sorry, 12.2-3, yeah. 12 yeah. 12 yeah. Sure I'll yeah. mm -hmm. second that motion. Okay, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, there's that. Thank you. Thank you. And then the next is um, just the motion to approve the preliminary application. I will make a motion that we we're, we're looking for completeness, or um, the just to approve the preliminary application. I, I will make a motion that we approve the preliminary application. I'll second. Okay. Further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Uh, between now and final, is there anything you guys want to see on the plan that's not there? Any other little bits of clarification that you think would help? Speak now or forever hold your peace. The, <laughs> <laughs> the drainage uh, plan, that, that is its own sketch, correct? The grading and drainage, yes. That's, okay. that's, I believe it's okay. sheet C5, I Okay. Think. Check that. I think that was the only thing we had from the last go. Mm. Grading and drainage is C4. Okay. And Iris, do you have anything that you'd like added on that, or? You know, I'm kind of more, I'm kind of more partial to blues, but. <laughs> 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 if you're gonna harass me about it. I'll find a shot of the pond this time. Right? <laughs> no, I think I think uh, the the changes that were made in regards to the wildlife is really what I was looking for. So. Um, I, I do have one question for you, though. You did say that they're going to let you know if those turtle signs can be covered at times of the year. Yeah. Will you notify me when you get that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they can stay up all year round. They just had this. I guess in some places they have like a little half the sign folds up when the turtles aren't migrating or, or whatever. I don't really see the need for it. Just oh, okay. There. Yeah, just leave them just there. Leave them there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Everybody will watch for them slowly. It was one of their things. So I'm like, okay. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving right along into new business, site plan <laughs> review, commercial storage, 1 Blackmore Road, R6818, Blackmore Road, LLC. Thank you. 
Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kevin Pullen from uh, Barry Surveying and Engineering. I'm uh, representing Blackmore Road LLC uh, for the proposed addition of uh, two storage unit buildings on tax map R68, uh, lot 18. Um, the subject parcel is about seven and a half acres consisting of uh, a few wetlands along the Driscoll Brook and uh, is primarily a nice sandy soil. Um, the uh, parcel is located within the uh, rural commercial industri industrial zone and there are three existing buildings on site. Um, so the proposal includes the addition of two uh, prefabricated steel construction storage buildings. Um, I believe one is 11,000 square feet and the other is just over 3,000. Um, this land use uh, requires a conditional use permit uh, which is part of the application before you today and a second additional uh, conditional use permit that is requested is for um, imp uh, filling in greater than 10 cubic yards within 75 feet of the Driscoll Brook, so within the stream uh, protection district. That disturbance, I believe, is about 1,500 square feet. I'd have to double check that. Um, so stormwater is uh, going to be treated and infiltrated in a series of uh, infiltration basins. Um, these infiltration basins will be treating flow for the proposed impervious surface um, as well as the uh, portion of the existing gravel driveway and existing buildings as well. Um, there is uh, two proposed conveyance swales uh, for the proposed impervious that protects uh, the Driscoll Brook from direct runoff. And as part of the proposal, uh, there is no uh, water or sewage connection proposed as these are two prefabricated steel structures. And uh, that's what I have for the board. Sorry, that went, that came at us pretty fast. Just, Sorry about that. You, no, no worries. Um, so you're requesting a waiver of the stormwater management requirement? Did I, did I hear that correctly? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. There are no waivers being requested. Oh, uh, no so waivers. No being waivers requested. are being requested. Okay. Uh, there are two. two uh, my apologies. No worries. Um, there's two conditional use permits being requested. Um, one of which is the storage use facility within the rural commercial industrial zone. And then the second conditional use permit is filling of greater than 10 cubic yards within the 75 foot stream protection zone. And that uh, 75 foot stream protection zone disturbance occurs in one location. Um, there is no impervious surface uh, proposed within 75 feet. That 75 foot is the grading for a conveyance soil uh, to route stormwater to an infiltration basin. I'm sorry, that, uh, my apologies, that st uh, stream protection zone impact is 3,281 square feet, and I believe it is... Uh, and then filling of 133 yards of earth within that zone for the creation of this conveyance soil. And that is the red hatched, uh, the red shaded area on the plan. Okay. Hannah, procedurally, uh, I personally, I, I just feel uh, us relaxing standards in your waterway is sets a bad precedent moving forward. Um, I would, would we be within our right to ask for a third party review to understand, fully understand the impact of what they're asking for, if we grant that, what the potential impact could be? Is, is that within our purview? If you want to. Yeah. I just want to make sure it's within our purview, and I don't want to put an undue burden on the applicant. But I, it, if it deals with a stream, I, I feel very strongly that we should condition that. Is this the appropriate time? Yes. So, so yeah. Okay. I would like a, a motion that if we are to approve the uh, request for your uh, conditional uh, piece for the stream, that that you would get a third independent third party reviewer. 
to evaluate the impact uh, of the facility as it relates to the stream and, and provide us with, with content on that. That would just be a condition. A, a condition, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll second that. Very good. Yeah, we don't have to vote. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just, we'll just add that sure. to the conditions, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right now, it's right now we're just basically looking at it and finding if the application is complete. Yes. Okay. We just want to make sure that everything's there. But yes, that would be. Um, we have had a couple other people that were close to waterways, and we, we've we, done that. We, no, we've denied them. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. okay. yes. So this is other. This is a different type of business where yeah. they're not going to be tapping into water or having runoff issues. So having a third party wouldn't be that bad to take a look at it. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair. Mary. Yep. Just for clarification purposes, the uh, current uses on the property are still going to stay that way. This is just additional uses. That is correct. Okay. I wasn't sure about that earlier. Thank you. Do you have anything, Hannah? Formulating a question. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the, the current uses is, what are we on? Storage garage and marijuana cultivation facility. When was, when were those approved? Do you know? I do not have the answer to that question okay. currently. Is that a, is that a use that's going to happen on this? Property? That's that was that's the current use that's of the structures that are already there. Okay. So these would be additional uses on top okay. of that. So it's just where I want that first approval. Was. Okay. Just for back login. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm just making yeah. sure I'm like, am I time traveling? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And this use is going to be uh, complete and separate from the other uses uh, as a run as a separate business and not part of what's happening there now. Yeah, they're going to be. Oh, you got to speak into the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. This is for the people that are watching on TV. If you want to just come and state your name and then answer the question. Uh, Dennis Robillard. Uh, they're going to be mini storage buildings, okay. 10 by 20. Okay. And the uh, second building is going to be a, a mini storage building, but they're going to be built a little bit bigger. They're going to be. Excuse me, could you speak louder? <clears throat> they're going to be 12 by uh, 40 feet deep. Okay. And there's only going to be four of those in that okay. larger building. Or the, it's a taller building. Are, 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 you, I, are I, you the owner or the developer, sir? I'm the owner. The owner. Quick. Thank you. So the this development has nothing to do with finding more storage capacity for, let's say, the marijuana uh, no, cultivation or, or that sort of thing? No, sir. Okay. So there's no interchange between one business and the other? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? No, not at this time. Thank you. Um, just to find the application complete. Nope, we're going to do that. That's later. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's when we approve the application. I got gotcha. you. That's okay. when we set the conditions. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Slow so what would happen is once this is uh, the application is found complete, then we do the site walk and the public yes. hearing. Okay. Cool. So this is just to say that their paperwork is correct, and that's it. Anything you else you need to see, Irish, for as, as it pertains to the application? So what, you don't want me saying more greens and browns? No. <laughs> well, I didn't bring colorful pictures. I'm sorry. <laughs> there is some red on there. Yeah, there is some red. So I got there. red this time. Okay. Okay. Bring some. Bring some we'll bring some crayons. Um, no, I I don't think I have anything else, Hannah. Um, just to clarify procedurally, you'll find the application complete or not, but find the application complete, then 
set the dates for the site walk public hearing and then in the meantime between now and the next meeting that's when we'll get the third party review done okay. so that'll be for when they come back great that'll be done okay. All right. perfect uh, with that i i will make a motion that we find the application complete i'll second that motion okay further discussion no. all in favor all right. okay thank you thank you thank you um, so site walk and public hearing um, I know the planning has been a little busy so is it two weeks is two weeks gonna be good enough or should we try and go for the the third because um, right now let's look at the calendar I think yeah so Okay, so we would be looking at the 18th um, of May. Unfortunately, probably. Okay. Um, just because I don't, I don't think I would trust it with mail the way it is to be able to get. Yeah, because we've had some issues with previous ones. That's why. The, yeah, we're just I trying would, to. Uh, James and I discussed that a little bit earlier and and pushing it out a little bit to make sure that we have time to get those notices properly delivered. Okay. So to the right. To the right. Give you time. Okay. Please. Okay. So May 18th. 18. What time do you guys want that? <sighs> five. Yeah. Does five work for you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Five. 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 yeah. Okay. Five o'clock. Five p.m. and then we'll meet you guys for the. Yeah. And if you could just like stake out where uh, the proposed building's going to be and stuff like that, that's just so we can see. The proposed building, and I would request that you stake out the area that's going to be the the, the wetland potential stuff. fill for that second conditional use. Yep. If you don't mind. Oh yeah, no. no okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yes. <laughs> All right, so moving along is the next public comment, open for non-agenda items. Um, could I speak on, on this item? Uh, pertaining to? To um, the uh, one Blackmore Road uh, building um, center. Yeah, I was just kind of asking, like, the subject to it. Like, uh, is it for the public hearing time or for uh, the? No, it's a, com it's a comment. I live on Blackmore Road. Uh, uh, if are you so like in a butter? Um, yes. Then no, we will wait till the public hearing time. Um, okay. So that will be May eighteenth, eighteen May. Yeah, okay. and then that's your time to speak. And, and as in a butter, you will receive notification, notification from the town of that date and time, yep. sir. Okay. And you know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> He's come and asked me a few questions previously for different things. So. Okay. Yep. All right. So the second public comment is open for non-agenda items. If you just state your name and address. Mm -hmm. My name is Pat Bovere, and I live at Six Country Lane. And um, we had written a letter um, that James forwarded to, um, to the town manager, forwarded to, um, I think, the town planner about working on um, performance standards for gas stations and convenience stores and a variety of other things. And I was just wondering if you received the letter and if you were working on those things. Yes, yes, we have been talking with James about those. And Pat, <laughs> okay. I did also send him my, my first rough drafts of those ordinances that I had drafted. Okay. So Good. it's, it's in, it's in the works. Yeah. I Between just, James and I and Hannah, we're trying to stay on top of, of things moving yeah. along. <laughs> no, I, I understand and appreciate that, but we're not going to forget about it, I, I assure you. No, oh, that's great. Okay, thanks. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Miss mm -hmm. Bovere, if it provides you any, any measure of comfort, too, I know, I know, no, I know myself and a, and a couple other board members, we, we have taken the time to review both the state and the federal standards because we're, we're kind of mm -hmm. getting smart on this as we go as well. Yeah. Um, and, and any forthcoming applicant will be held to those standards. And, and I think as we previously told you, we, we are allowed to uh, further condition any mm -hmm. applicant if, if we so desire. 
um, and, and it will be uh, highly scrutinized just mm -hmm. due to the nature of the, of the business. So I, I hope you have faith in our abilities. I and definitely have faith in you. Okay, so we will, we will <laughs> guess, do our due um, diligence, ma'am. Yes, I, I guess um, I was just coming from the point that um, noticing some things that the land use ordinance can use um, to get beefed up and, and be more important, not just gas stations, but other issues also. And that um, rather than, I felt kind of bad, Irish, that you were kind of making them up. I don't know if you were trying to get them from other places. Or. Uh, basically what I did was I did uh, part, of, part of doing any sort of good ordinance mm -hmm. is getting, uh, yes, reviewing other, other municipalities' ordinances, which it's very difficult to find uh, fuel station ordinances. So I uh, managed to find a few. I was doing that solar. I was doing a few things because you're right. There, is a, there are some things, uh, I mean, as we grow that should be yeah. added, changed, what have you. Um, and then I just kind of I put all of the thoughts and all of the concerns that have been addressed into, into those performance standards. Uh -huh. and drafted a couple of them and sent them off to James and he uh, played with them and sent them back to me and I played <laughs> with them and I think Hannah's probably, if you haven't seen them, we'll be seeing them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're making progress and yes, you're right, there's a lot in the land use ordinance that probably could use beefing up, but that's going to be kind of winter project for a lot of the yeah, other things to mm -hmm. be able to get well, on the next year's obviously ballot. Obviously things are very busy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> you have also, no idea. I guess I was just kind of wondering, I was surprised to hear that you were doing that because that isn't really what a CEO does. So um, 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 that's, why I, that's why I thought it was important that it get forwarded to um, a town planner because yes. you have enough stuff to do as a CEO. Yes, I do. Um, so that, I just... That having been said, uh, you know, I've only been with the town for uh, about five or six months now. Mm -hmm. um, you, you guys are all going to learn exactly what our board and my boss has learned, which is that I'm not um, queen of staying in my lane, so to speak. If there's a need, it needs to be addressed and there's nobody available to do it, mm -hmm. I will jump in and, and do that. And although it may seem um, unusual for a, a code enforcement officer to be willing to do that. Uh, I my whole job, well, half of my job, half of my job is from the state. The other half is from the land use ordinances. Mm -hmm. So it to me, it's just it's part of my job. I have to enforce these things. So why not participate in the writing and, and upgrading of them? Because when push comes to shove, um, you know, let's say I stepped out of it completely right now, and and Hannah wrote the entire ordinance. Mm -hmm. And then our boards go ahead and they, they vote them all through. The townspeople vote on them. Everything's great. They condition these things. If somebody's not doing what they're supposed to, who is everybody calling? So I have to know the, the ordinances inside and out anyway. So I may as well step in from the front. Mm -hmm. And that way I can make sure that things are worded and presented. The things that people uh, commonly have concerns about that they contact me about, those are things I can ensure get added to the ordinances. That's also part of why I will be um, much more of an active participant at these meetings as per my conversations with the board, mm -hmm. um, because there are certain things that tend to come back on later on for site plans or subdivision plans that are common complaints that I, if we have them on the plans to begin with or in our ordinances to begin with, it gives me the teeth I need to do my enforcement. So for me, it makes sense for me to be actively involved in all those portions. Mm -hmm. I think it sounds like a good plan that you are working with James and then you go to Hannah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because oh, I'm not the last step. I'm no, the first no, no. step. <laughs> right, right. No, I mean, I think having everyone involved is probably very helpful. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you for being involved and engaged and holding us accountable. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank and you. and I will admit, you know, by by me and James kind of working on this at the front end before we pass it to Hannah, it's less of her hours and saves the town a little bit of money because we do have to <laughs> we have to pay her handsomely. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other public comment? No. Nope. All right. Close that. And next is informational items. This is where they all stare at me and I get the deer in the headlight look. 
Hey, Hannah, anything informational for you? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know. <laughs> uh, well, we've got uh, applications rolling in. Uh, oh, oh, I get to give you guys my happy update. Okay. So we will have a new contract was signed today, so I'm sure James is okay with me saying this, and if not, I'm sure I'll hear about it on Monday morning, but as of May 15th, uh, yeah, May is next month. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I've been a little overwhelmed. As of May 15th, we will officially have a new administrative assistant for codes and planning, and I can tell you, I, I, I won't out her name just yet, but I can tell you I happen to know this individual. It's somebody I've worked with in the past. She has previous experience as an administrative assistant in a very busy planning and code office. So, um, excuse me, happy dance yeah. for me. Uh, <laughs> it's about to get a lot easier. She, um, I will still obviously, as we discussed last time, want to be here. And as I just said, want to be here for these meetings. Um, I enjoy, I enjoy the company, the knowledge, and the ability to throw my two cents into the ring. Um, but she will come for a few and, and get to know everybody and how things work. And, and I think you guys will like her. I think it's going to work out pretty well. Yeah, right. Good news. So I am. That is like the best informational item I've ever been able to drop on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a project I emailed you guys today. Uh, so we're currently having fun with the Sam Villa Estates at the South Barwick while well, we're going to be doing that. But on the other side of town, um, there is an application that has been presented to North Barwick. I emailed you guys out today and actually mm -hmm. have not received the correct agenda. The agenda that came with the email was last week's agenda, but I'm sure he'll, he's just as frazzled as the rest of us, so I'm sure he'll get that to us. But there is going to be another project with North Barwick. Um, I don't even know if I told you about that one yet. No. I hope I've got you on my planning board uh, email list. But so it's a um, uh, David Springer has a subdivision he's proposing in North Berwick. This one is a little bit different than what we've got going with South Berwick because this one actually has, I believe, I've looked five at lots. the plans, five yeah. lots in Berwick. So mm -hmm. there will be actually like development as opposed to the other one, which is just an address issue. So that is something that they are meeting next week about. That was in the email. I don't know if anybody or everybody is going to be available. Um, but I assume standard operating rules apply that uh, we have to make a quorum in order to be able to get a vote. But since we have the uh, privilege of having the lovely Hannah here, does that matter at the, at the first meeting? It's a great question. Will you get back to me on that? I will yeah. not put you on the spot on yeah. that. I'd rather. Considering the fact that we're also the planner for North Berwick and I didn't know about it, uh, oh. I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, well, then Matt's got some explaining to do. Yes. But, um, <laughs> do you have any early read ahead on that, whether that's going to be public water and sewer or private? Um, I think it's going to be that's private. That's private. It's private. Yeah, okay. That is okay. private. Our, our okay. Area for I, um, because right. that would introduce its own unique set of challenges, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Sure. No, uh, uh, full disclosure, prior to this being um, <clears throat> submitted to North Berwick, I did speak with uh, the develop uh, somebody from the developers uh, that the developer had contracted, and he basically just had some questions as far as, A, how, how he should go about the submittal, and I did explain to him that what we were doing with South Barwick and that we can, in fact, do that this way as well rather than breaking it into two. Um, and then there was a question about open space, which we actually ended up with uh, answers from Lee Jay and Hannah for him that he needed those an answers in order to be able to put together his submittal for Mr. Springer and, and put that in. So uh, I just always try to be as transparent so as possible. So five, excuse me, five of these lots will be in Berwick. How many are in North Berwick? 23, I believe. Oh, okay. All right. So it's, it's, it's a lot of acreage. Yeah. It's it over a hundred acres. Yeah. 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 It's a massive parcel. It's a very large project. Um, but uh, again, very minimal impact into Berwick, just yeah. like the North Berwick one. So yeah. um, if you guys could let me know when you get a chance to check your emails and just shoot me back, let me know if you guys can make it to that. 
uh, meeting. Um, I want to say it's next Wednesday. And again, I only bring in the next Thursday, the 27th. Thursday. Thank yes. you. Okay. See? Bring my birthday cake, please. Oh. <laughs> is that your birthday? Yes, it is. Oh, my God. Ah. Cake. <laughs> you know, you just you just give me too many weapons here. <laughs> I wish you up. I'll carry the cupcake covered with candles and uh, I don't know. Has one of you guys ever been a volunteer firefighter that can carry the fire Ooh, extinguisher? Wow, shots fired. <laughs> well, they told me that was the geriatric side, so if I'm going to put them on a cupcake, that's what you said. But I would like to remind you, it's also the best looking side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amen. staying right out yeah. of that one. All right, moving along. Any, I don't need any to get fired for sexual uh, harassment at a planning board. Any other <laughs> further informational items? I think that was about. Do we want to say anything about? Last night's meeting for those who weren't there. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. So, um, do you want to take that one, Hannah? For the, do you want to say anything? You want me to start? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, so you're as good at being put on the spot as I am. I get used to it from James. Um, so last night we went. We had the meeting on Sandville Estates. Basically, gate is gone. That's been decided as a, a no no. Um, we are. There were some wonderful suggestions given to. Um, Mr. Wood, Ken, yes. uh, about what some possible other options are because the concern is obviously still mixing industrial traffic with you know, residential. Um, so some of the things that were proposed are perhaps making the, the little stretch between the development and the town line a one-way only um, or some sort of you know speed restriction or weight limit restriction, something to kind of mitigate that. Um, but basically it was determined that, it, you know, it, it's got to be a second egress and having a gate there just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in the overall safety scheme. Um, we're going to just have everything kind of roll through conditions on their, their side. Um, we I'm do assume, have to, yeah. And I'm assuming we will get plans for the roadway improvements at some point because I haven't seen those yet um, so I assume those will be forthcoming um, I'm curious as to how they're going to treat the cul-de-sac um, but I guess we will see mm -hmm. we Hannah it, am I being overly naive in, in my assumption that the development of that or the improvement of that road is that incumbent upon the developer or yes. is that incumbent upon the town that is the developer. It is, okay. Yes. Right. By using that road as their access point, they need to improve it. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And set it to town standards, okay. which we have updated our standards. We yes. our standards, so I'm yours. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Phil. <Bill. laughs> I'm not the only one. So this, uh, um, something that I was looking at today, and I, I've been kind of all over the place, does the owner of that, does, does MIC Property Management also own Industry Drive, that end of it? Because I know they I think own a they parcel did it at one on point, end. but I don't know what the current ownership is. Yeah, they do. Sure is. They own a they, parcel on that end. I know. Yes. Yeah, yeah a lot okay. of it. Okay, so it would probably be incumbent on them to begin with. Yeah. So, but they're not here, so we can't really talk that much yeah. about. No, it. I was just yeah. curious no. about ownership. <laughs> but thank you for keeping me yeah. in my place, Mr. Chair. The only Chair. other thing that I didn't get to add last night, and Jerry and I talked about it, was either a light or a flashing caution light on Route Four. Mm -hmm. To, yes, and because you because not only you have industrial vehicles coming out of there, you're going to have um, civilian cars coming out of there, and you sort of turn lanes. School buses, school buses, school buses, buses coming right. out. Of there. So it would probably be good to. So if I forget the next time, please remind me. I've written it in here. Thank Hannah's you. making a note, and I think that would probably come to the be an addition well, when is, we have the traffic. There is a yeah. pending traffic study. Well, that's part yeah, of the DOT uh, it's already already recommend that, on the roll. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I talked to James right. yesterday. And he said, uh, yeah, I think yeah. the DOT survey would probably address that. But yeah, well, we can make sure. Uh, that's the other thing that was discussed is that when we do at the, another meeting. There will be a uh, the traffic study person will be there to answer all of our questions. So if you guys aren't able to make it, shoot us, uh, shoot somebody, one of us. Uh, your questions That's on May are 3rd, propositions. Five uh, o'clock. So right. Yes, the sidewalk. Okay. And the meetings at seven. 
Yes, and the site okay. walk we're meeting on uh, our end of Industry Drive, and oh, nice. we're going to walk through, and Hershey told us to make sure we wear muck boots and remember mm -hmm. it's tick season. Yes. Those are key points. It is a very wet area over there. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I remember um, that with the, uh, the cement processing place. Yeah. That site walk was kind of wet. But I believe that was most everything of importance for those of you that weren't able to attend. So. The only vote per se was it wasn't an official vote was was about the gate. Yeah, so. there was a show of hands. Yeah. Yes, okay, Jerry. Um, you're going to notify the people on Industrial Drive. Yes. Yes. The, I've you're already right. got the abutters notices drafted. They just need to be sent out. Thanks. And I'm working all weekend, so nope. they'll go. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting yeah. public hearing. I think if we didn't <laughs> yes. include them, there would be trouble. Oh no, yeah, there, yeah. there's. I'm doing the abutters there, and I do apologize, Paul. I was just teasing about the fire extinguisher. Sure. No sure disrespect intended. Yeah. No disrespect intended. He's already, he's already lawyered up. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go pack my office. <laughs> 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 If there are no uh, further items for discussion uh, from the esteemed Burgess meeting room in the depths of the Berwick Town Hall, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn. And I will second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Good night.